The views and opinions expressed by our guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the California Secretary of State's office. Hello, Promote the Vote listeners. I am Kalika Edwards, and I am an elections analyst and outreach coordinator with the Secretary of State's office in the Elections Division. Today, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Julian, and I'll give her the floor to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Julian Castillo, and I'm also an elections analyst and outreach coordinator with the Secretary of State's office. Kalika and I are so honored to be your hosts today. We want to give a big, genuine thank you to everyone who is tuning in to the third and final episode of This is Promote the Vote California, the podcast. I know what you're thinking. What? How could it possibly be over already? Well, we envisioned this being a brief summer series, but who knows what the future holds for us and this podcast. Stay tuned. For now, we are just so grateful for the guests that we have had and for the conversations that we've been able to share with you all. Promote the Vote California is an exciting and spirited initiative from the Secretary of State's office that is focused on California communities and doing our part to advocate for a strong civic culture. Our core mission is to tap into the power of partnership by building relationships with businesses and organizations to support California communities and to boost that civic culture. We want to create spaces for meaningful dialogue among individuals and groups, all while providing reliable, accessible, and trusted information on voting and individual power. The California Secretary of State's office is currently doing work to honor the 60th anniversary of Freedom Summer, and we hope to honor it as well through this podcast. We want to further the conversation around voter education, service, civic engagement, and equity in California communities that was started with Freedom Summer's Catalyst Action. The actions from Freedom Summer will always stand as a testament to the power of unity. This historic movement served as the heart behind the enactment of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We also want to do our part in keeping the conversation that was started by Freedom Summer going. Today, we are doing just that with our guest, Darcy Totten from the California Coalition on the Status of Women and Girls. We will be discussing gender equity and civic engagement in the state of California and beyond. Darcy is currently acting as the Interim Executive Director for the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls, after previously holding roles as the Commission's Director of Communications and the Director of External Affairs since being hired in 2019. She has over 20 years of experience in crisis communications, journalism, and public policy advocacy. Darcy is an expert in social impact strategies and crisis communication. She has experience in educational leadership, political campaigns, tribal governments, and public policy. Darcy is passionate about building inclusive teams that prioritize marginalized communities. Darcy is also a former board member for the Sacramento LGBT Center. She is a fellow of the Nehemiah Emerging Leaders Program, a CARO fellow, and a Next City Vanguard Fellow recognized as one of the urban innovators under 40 in 2019. We are so excited to bring you this conversation today. We hope you enjoy it. Um, Here is our conversation with Darcy. Let's do it. All right. Well, Darcy, thank you so much for joining us today. And with all Sincerity, thank you for being such a wonderful Promote the Vote partner, you and your organization, the passion that you guys have, the dedication to the work that you do is just, it's so exciting. And so when we um, were lucky enough to kind of establish this partnership, it was like from the get go, just boom, 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 ideas, excitement. What can we do next? Goals. Like it was, it was just so um, wonderful to kind of have that excitement in, in a partnership. So we just wanted to first and foremost, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. we're so excited. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, the feeling is mutual. So with all of that, can you just tell us a little bit of, about the work that goes on with the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls? Absolutely. And thank you for having me today. And and thank you for being so open to this partnership. We're really excited to be working with the Secretary of State's office and specifically to be working on these issues collaboratively. 
Um, the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls is an independent state agency. That's a, a sort of a weird category in government. Uh, we're, we're tiny, we are an agency, and we are kind of like off over here doing our thing uh, and have been for the last almost 60 years. We're going to be 60 years old next year. Uh, and during that time, the bulk of our work is about advocating for policies, investments, uh, and energy targeted to centering the needs of the state's women and women and girls, which have changed significantly over the last 60 years. Uh, so there's just decades of research, advocacy, leadership, advising, policy work. And all of that has added up to something that we know absolutely for certain, and that is sort of what, where we are starting from, which is that the structures of all of our life, right? Our economy, our government, our media, our basic infrastructure, how education works, none of it was built with women in mind. It wasn't built with the idea that we would be full and equal participants. And so it's sort of silly to assume that we have somehow built us all into all of those things perfectly in just the last 50 or 60 years. That is the work that we do. That's our focus. So, you know, where do you begin with such a big job? We really try to focus on structural change. What are the, what are the sort of big ticket things that if you change the structure, gender equity will follow? Um, and, you know, what are the policy solutions? What are some of the programmatic solutions? What is it going to take for women and girls to be able to achieve economic security, health equity, and, you know, justice, right? Like these sort of big conceptual umbrella ideas. Our work is really to sort of parse that and figure out how to make those things real instead of just ideals that we're striving towards, right? Like I always, um, I always talk about the commission's work as being a thing that I am so, so proud to be able to lead right now. And it is my sincere hope that someday I won't have a job like this because jobs like this won't be necessary. We won't need, we won't need them. Mm -hmm. So a just a little bit about the structure of the commission. We have 17 commissioners that are appointed by the Senate, the assembly, the governor, the labor commissioner statutorily appointed and the, um, uh, SPI also gets to appoint somebody and they, you know, when we were first built, it was predominantly men. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're super proud of the fact that they're all now powerhouse women that really reflect the diversity of the state of California and they're from across the, the, the state in like various areas. And that, you know, the commission's really working hard to reframe conversations about women's impact and women's value in these systems that weren't made for us. Um, what is a more accurate representation of intersectional experience and our contributions to California? We're half the population. We do a lot of things. Wow. You guys do a lot, a lot of work and there's so much synergy between us and um, the commission. Promote the Vote's main focus is building a more inclusive civic culture statewide. We strive to provide nonpartisan voter education and access to voter to resources that will in turn, we hope, translate into civic action and get people to show up to the polls. How does the work of the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls translate into action? I love this question. Um, so <laughs> the thing is, 60 years of reviewing every issue faced by women and girls across the state uh, through what we call a gender lens has taught us a couple of things about how to translate into action. So one of those things is that, you know, the structures themselves have to change. So we do a lot of policy work. I'm really proud of that because we're an independent state agency. We are able to advocate. Uh, we co-sponsor legislation and we support these efforts to really change how things work. So a great example of that was uh, this commission helped eliminate the pink tax in California. It used to be legal to charge women more for products just because they were pink uh, or marketed to women. You can't do that here anymore. We're really proud of that. We also supported uh, Senator Monique Lamone's pay transparency bill. We were co-sponsors of that and worked. I was so proud to work on that. Um, you know, that the really has helped elevate transparency around pay and pay equity and help close those wage gaps. 
And part of that also is we have an incredible program with the first partner uh, called the California Equal Pay Pledge, where companies can actually voluntarily sign a pledge uh, agreeing to internal pay equity audits and to sort of adjust their own practices to be more equitable. Uh, you know, we, we partner with nonprofits, we oversee multi million dollar grant programs, we work across government to partner with community based organizations as well as other government organizations. Uh, everything that we do sort of touches women because everything does, right? Equal pay to equal access, reproductive rights to childcare, your first job all the way to retirement. We are, we are on all of it. And so one of the things about that is that you can't be overly controlling of any piece of that. That is, it is the, the, the through line of sort of solidarity work. We are all so, so different. Women do not all have the same experience. We all have different experiences of discrimination, of challenges that we are facing. And the only way that we are all going to get somewhere resembling equity is if we are all doing it together at once and supporting each other. So that's a huge focus for us, right? The the idea that everybody has to sort of get in line behind someone, we don't do that. We're like, nope, we just, we don't do pipelines. We do really wide pathways and everybody's coming and we're all going at the same time. And we're really intentional about that. Mm -hmm. um, the other part is sort of helping other folks who might not see the world through that gender lens, understand that everything is a gender equity issue. We're half the people half of the citizens experience some degree of discrimination, which is then for the most part compounded by other points of discrimination in our lives, right? Like we don't have single issue lives, we have big complicated intersectional lives. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a story actually. So I was just having dinner recently with a friend who was talking to me about um, like an event they were putting together for a small business forum or what have you. And it was actually like the second or third conversation like this that I had had in a number of weeks where it was women leading these sort of efforts for small businesses. And I'm sitting there going, well, where's the commission's invitation? We'd like to come. And they go, oh, well, it's not really about women. It's about small businesses. <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm going, do you know who owns all of the small businesses in California? <laughs> Let me break this down for you. The small business issue is absolutely a gender equity issue. Yes, 100%. Um, so, so, you know, and every time all of those yeah. folks who are friends of mine who would like know that this is my work going, oh, yeah, huh, yes, you're right. <laughs> you know? So some of our work is just that, it's just helping people sort of shift their thinking to understanding that there is no sort of gender neutral point in which we all have equal access to the same opportunities mm -hmm. for advancement that we actually have to change those structures. Absolutely. 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 Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, that half the focus there is just making people aware of these issues that are going on. My dad is a father to three girls. Do I think he knew that our products cost more? Probably not. <laughs> like that's not mm -hmm. something that like he was probably cognizant of, not because he's, you know, trying to avoid those things, just because it, it wasn't in his immediate realm. So like he was just not aware of that. So I love that half the work is just letting people know, just like bringing, bringing these things to the forefront so other people can be mindful of them and then we can all work together to kind of do away with them. I love that. Um, but something that you mentioned um, in the uh, the first question was regards to entire nation's government structures were not built with women in mind. That mm -hmm. is pretty obvious. <laughs> and like as time goes on, we're trying to eradicate those. Um, but something that that reminded me of was um, that women could not apply for their own credit cards or their own loans until 1974. That blows my mind. And mm -hmm. so there are, the, it continues to be issues that that come up that women and girls, those who um, support women and girls are trying to fight for continue like to this day, 2024. And so that leads me to my next question. So according to a report done by the Center for American Women in Politics, the number of female voters has exceeded the number of male voters in every presidential election since 1964. So I'm curious to know if that is an encouraging statistic for you, or does it speak to issues that women and girls continue to face and are fighting for with their ballots? So 
first of all, let me blow your mind a little bit more because we can get business loans without a man's co-signature till the eighties. Till the eighties. I was I was I was oh comfortably in elementary school before my mother could get her own loan to start her own business without my dad's signature. Oh um And the thing about these voting statistics is I, I'm, um, <laughs> I try, I work really hard at sort of having a positive, like forward outlook. Yeah. But some of, some of that for me, uh, you know, people tease me about being overly negative on some of the data and I'm like, no, you gotta understand. It means I'm hopeful. Cause if mm -hmm. I'm worried about it, it means I know for sure we can change it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going to stress about things I think are immovable. But this kind of data, I actually find a little bit depressing because mm -hmm. what it means is some of us are absolutely still not voting for all of us, right? We are not seeing um, the sort of solidarity effort that, that we are promoting reflected necessarily in some of these outcomes or how, that the, how these work. Um, and unfortunately, that makes us women, the collective, a constituency that's actually really easy to leverage for people that might not care about us at all. And mm -hmm. so I am constantly like, hold on, we don't have to agree on any of these issues. We don't have mm -hmm. to belong to the same parties. We don't have to think the same way. But we do need to recognize that we are a large population of people who should not stand for being used for other people's agendas. Mm -hmm. That should fly. So the other sort of data that we see outside of just who's voting more is what issues they're voting on, right? One of the things we do know are the issues that impact women specifically. And, and I'm always cautious about referencing women's issues, right? Because there's this sort of nonsense idea that that is exclusively related to our biology or our reproductive mm -hmm. capacity, right? Like mm -hmm. women's issues are everything. The economy is a women's issue. Mm -hmm. But you know, just for the sake of the kind of data that we measure, one of the things that we measure is that when women, when women have seen their right to privacy, for example, on the line, they show up in droves to vote on that issue. Bodily autonomy is another one, right? They show up to vote for their own autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, and we see this time and time again in state races. But we don't necessarily see it work when women are in a position to vote in a way that could protect each other uh for women that they see as maybe unlike themselves we start to lose our grip on that solidarity we need to learn from that we need to do better that is something we have done wrong in the past we absolutely have this incredible moment right now where we're seeing sort of organic solidarity coalesce around some of the campaigns that are happening in this moment and we need to lean into that so hard we mm -hmm. absolutely have got to the way I try and explain it for young people in my life, right, is that you're you're not just voting for yourself and your own beliefs and your own issues. You are also voting for the people around you, for your community, for your family, for the people who, for whatever reason, can't vote, who cannot show up and speak for themselves, right? There are young people and there are people, right, there's all sorts of reasons that we need to be bringing our whole selves and our whole communities into those voting booths with us. And that is something the data is also pretty clear on women are great at that. It is one of the reasons why when you put us on corporate boards, those companies make so much more money, right? We are big community thinkers. And for mm -hmm. some reason, we lose our grip on that when it comes time to vote. And we need to stop doing that. We need to think about the aggregate. Right. So one of the things that I'll also say is the commission is currently working on an archive project, right? We are sorting through and it's I'm a nerd, so I love it. Like big dusty box, <laughs> 60 years worth of history. And we're cataloging that history and we're looking at the work the commission's done for the last 60 years. And one of the things we're seeing is that for all of our progress, we're still fighting some of the same fights we were fighting 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a really good reminder that 60 years is not that long. Mm -hmm. It's an equally good reminder that um, the arguments are the same and they are tired and we can move past that, right? The, <laughs> the idea that... Um, you know, we're looking around at kind of an imperfect world and the people trying to blame the world's imperfections on women is an old tired argument. That's not it. We don't need to do that. It's a mess. So we are asking <laughs> all women to show up and participate in democracy and we don't care how, right? Like vote for who you want to vote for, vote on your issues, vote for your family and your community. But we want women to show up for each other 
you know, let go of the idea that voting isn't your thing or that like voting isn't, you know, important. It is important because we are hopeful that sort of a recommitment to participatory democracy is actually the thing we need to get some of these old tired arguments out and uh, keep keep progress moving, right? The the idea that sort of, you know, you're just gonna sit out the one opportunity we've all been gifted mm -hmm. uh, as citizens of this country to participate. It's, um, I know people sort of complain about it or they're frustrated by it. Like, I, I wanna be empathetic to the fact that there's reasons people wanna set that out. And also, like I said, you gotta have some hope, right? Like there's, there's you gotta have hope that if you try to make things better, you actually can make things better. And I will say, we've made a ton of progress over the last 60 years. The fact that there's a lot more work left to do does not uh, negate the work that has been done or the progress that has been made. In fact, to me, it gives me tons of hope that there's the opportunity to make that much more, right? So right now, women coming together, like, a little bit about me, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but um, my background's in crisis management, right? And so there's sort of one thing I always tell people I learned in doing that, which is that there's no better time to build a new thing than when the old thing is crashing down around your ears, right? Like when everything is chaos and you're like, oh my God, the world's upside down, everything's not. <laughs> that is the best time. Chaos is generative. You can make a whole new world when things feel like they're all falling apart, right? You just have to fight the urge to panic about the falling apart of the familiar mm -hmm. and keep, you know, sort of eyes on the prize, like get to the place you want to go. And you got to do that with people. You got to bring everybody along together. So this is a moment where women can come together and as wild as it feels, like we are inches from being whole and equal citizens under the law we never have been before, right? Like the American Bar Association has just, I don't know if you saw this, released a, uh, a memo basically saying that they believe it to be unconstitutional to hold the Equal Rights Amendment to an arbitrary timeline. They think it should be published immediately. We have a fully ratified constitutional amendment that puts women in the Constitution that is held up on minor, minor procedural items. Mm -hmm. and, and it's easy to be so, you know, <laughs> you are about it, right? Mm -hmm. We're so close. That yeah. is the structural change I am talking about. That is the change we are waiting for. We get to do that. We're going to do that. In our lifetimes, we are going to be in the Constitution. But mm -hmm. you got to vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I think when we go back to the conversation about um, access and gender, you know, across spectrums, health, safety, employment, education, um, I know a question that we face a lot in the field doing outreach work is um, why you should vote and making the connection between um, gender equity um, uh, and voting, especially to young women is so very important. So how would you ask answer that question? So, <laughs> um just I, like bluntly uh men have had hundreds of years as the majority in congress as judges as captains of industry right and they had all of they had that head start because they made it illegal for us to participate we were absolutely kept out and and i want to highlight like we didn't all get the rights to participate at the same time either right? right women of color have had very different experiences than white women and uh, like even that group is pretty well segmented right mm -hmm. that we have uh, a number of challenges that we have overcome very very quickly but we still don't have the same rights as men the collective right mm -hmm. we don't have the same access to power we don't have the same access to resources uh but if we did, what we would have is something that's like a deeply American ideal. We'd have the a merit-based government. If everyone mm -hmm. had the same access at the beginning, that is the eventual outcome, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not about rigging the outcomes. It's about ensuring that the beginning, the starting line is exactly fair. Um, 
And in that case, the best ideas are the ones that are going to win. That's an ideal. It's something we want to live up to. So we don't just want the best ideas of those who happen to have amassed the most power over years through whatever means. We want the best ideas of everybody. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say about right now, right, and that gender equity piece is big changes here right? Like we are not waiting for some big change moment. It's happening right now. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity. This is a historical moment to participate, to sort of get involved. And I don't just mean presidential elections, right? Your local elections govern your day-to-day -day life, right? Who I vote for is the reason my street outside my house right now is being repaved, which is great because those potholes were costing me teeth, right? Like <laughs> who I vote for in my local elections are why I just got my pipes replaced and I have cleaner water in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Who I vote for runs the actual day-to-day -day quality of my life and my health and my access to opportunity and for all of my neighbors and my family and the people I care about. Mm -hmm. Voting is absolutely the voice that you have, right? We, you know, the Ann Richards quote, you want women to be at the table, otherwise they're on the menu. <laughs> you have to be more than at the table, right? We don't need a representative at the table. We need to, you know, run the table in a lot of <laughs> ways. Sometimes you gotta flip the tables, but either way, whatever it is, we need to be working together as part right like participatory governance means that we have to participate voting is one way that we participate we have to show up for each other and then once we do that we have to be willing to work collaboratively even when we disagree and that is the hardest best part about sort of women in politics is, is learning how to do that Mm -hmm. We have to show up for not just the people that we care about and the issues that impact them. We also have to use all of our resources to protect sort of more vulnerable people in our communities, people who are less able to show up in some of those ways to move our whole society forward, to move yeah. our economy, right? Like nobody is loving gas prices mm -hmm. or grocery store prices mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. The economy is a woman's issue. It is not a political party's issue. It is also a gender issue. It is more our issue than almost anybody else because guess who's feeding our families and guess who's worried about taking care of our whole communities? That's us. Democracy, this sort of participation in it, this is a team sport. I feel like that's one thing I can't highlight enough, right? That's if you are under the impression that voting is your individual moment alone in a booth where you get to have only your opinion about yourself. I feel like that's actually sort of something we did wrong telling people that you're not alone in this. It is you and everyone you care about in that booth at that moment. It is you and everyone you worried about. It is a game that we were all collectively kept from playing for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we're like endlessly trying to catch up, that's not it. We're, we're allowed in, we get to play. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. wild to me that any women would consider not playing, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is our opportunity to change the things that directly impact us. Mm -hmm. And I think young women in California, I just want to say this real fast. They're so much more aware of this than I think people give them credit for, right? Mm -hmm. Like young people are so on it. They have mm -hmm. seen firsthand what it means to have their rights always on the ballot, young mm -hmm. women especially, right? Like these are are women who are raised by women my age right now who are just, you know, they're able to vote now, mm -hmm. who in real time have watched rights that they grew up with, that they were sure they'd have forever be taken away. Mm -hmm. They are more aware than anybody that that is possible. Mm -hmm. They're also people who grew up with really, really intense challenges that people my age didn't necessarily have. And they have watched uh, government not necessarily be responsive to their requests mm -hmm. to make changes. Mm -hmm. This is their opportunity to say, well, <laughs> the coolest thing about American democracy is we get to throw you out of your job if you're not doing what we need you <laughs> to do. Right? If you won't protect our health and safety, you can go find work somewhere else. We will put somebody in who can. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really, like, that kind of gets us to the heart and soul of what the commission's work is. We don't talk about gender issues as a moral obligation. We don't talk about it as uh, sort of people should do the right thing. If people were going to do this on moral grounds, they would have done it by now, right? 
We talk about the economy of our future demanding gender equity right now. We talk about democracy and the fact that its strength is in active participation. Um, we talk about the future of our country as being reliant on our collective imagination and collaboration and willingness to work together that like makes a world that really reflects sort of our highest ideal that this is a country by for and, and you know by for and of all of the mm -hmm. people who live here yeah. and we have to show up together and co-create a government that reflects our value as half of the people here mm -hmm. uh, so that is that is the heart and soul of us there <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> no, I so, think I guess I the think... last little if I get a if I get an ending. Oh yeah. Point, <laughs> one thing I would say to women right now, especially voting. Um, one of the things I keep hearing that's really like I'm always kind of like batting it away is you know, the vote like your life depends on it, sort of memes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, don't. I want you to vote like my life depends on it. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about people who aren't you when you're there. I want you to vote like your best friend's life depends on it mm -hmm. or your mother's or your grandmother's because whatever our different politics are, we are a team. We do have to start acting like it. And the first place to do that is how we show up for each other and how we build a government that takes care of all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you mentioned really quickly, you said something along the lines of it's not just, it's not just you and your ballot, you know, in that polling booth, like you are carrying the livelihood of like so many people on your shoulders when you go and you take action, your friends, your family, your community. One thing about, you know, kind of women, I don't want to generalize them at, at all, but like our, our sense of care for the people around us, it's such a superpower. And I really, really hope it translates to civic action, to voting, to encouraging your friends to vote, to create a plan you know, something that Cleek and I have been saying on, on our little podcast here is like, friends don't let friends sit out elections. Like, <laughs> if, even if you are talking to these people who do not have the ability or maybe don't have the access, then you're also voting for them with them in mind. And I think that's something that's so important to, to remember is, you know, the clock, clock is ticking, you know, November is around the corner. So I think just making sure that we keep that kind of responsibility in mind, and it shouldn't be you know, a, a scary thing. It should be a very liberating and exciting and powerful thing that we have the opportunity to carry our friends and our families with us, you know, when, when we make these decisions. So it should be exciting. And I hope people are, yeah. <laughs> are excited to do that. I'm so excited. Well, the other thing is I want people to not be afraid to talk to yeah. people who don't agree with them mm -hmm. to be sort of collaborative in that way, right? Um, my family, we, every, every opportunity, right, because it's California, so we get mail-in ballots, mm -hmm. um, we will actually host parties at our house with people from across the spectrum, because we have friends of oh. all political parties, mm -hmm. and we will just debate and discuss the things on the ballot. Uh, and then everyone will go home and vote how they're gonna vote. But we will have actual, you know, with people who like and respect each other, mm -hmm. and they're not sort of in this nasty kind of media cycle version yeah. of everybody yelling at each other. Mm -hmm. We'll sit down and sort of say, I heard this, no, I heard this, or these people mm -hmm. think this, or this is what it will do, mm -hmm. so that when folks are leaving to vote on a ballot measure about where their tax money goes, everyone actually feels like they heard all sides of an argument and can right. go make a, make a decision based on that. That is something that feels very collaborative and community oriented. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important that we sort of get ourselves back to a place, women in particular, mm -hmm. where we we feel obligated to participate in mm -hmm. um, this sort of circus that like sometimes national politics can present us as though that's the only way to do politics. We can do this in a collaborative way where we mm -hmm. recognize that it is, this is our country, it's our place. These are our communities and mm -hmm. we all matter and we all have a voice and we can work together to make it better for everybody. Absolutely. That's something we are actually encouraging people to do this election season. That's something that my family has always done. We get together, we talk about what's on the ballot, what are the local issues, who are the local representatives and how they impact our community. Um, for us, it's, you know, a lot of people sacrificed and um, suffered for us to get the ability to vote. So it is our responsibility to carry, as my mom likes to say, carry them on our backs 
uh, when we go to the polls. So um, community is very much the focus of our message for Promote the Vote this mm -hmm. election season. And I think it helps to make the idea of voting a little less daunting. When mm -hmm. you know you're going to get together with your friends and your family, people who trust who you trust and you they don't judge you or, or what you do and do not know to help make those decisions or to help open your perspective, I think is such a great thing to think about doing for when you're filling out your ballot or preparing to go to vote in person. Absolutely. Well, and I think it also helps make it feel less like a chore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not one more thing you have to figure out. <laughs> I have um, young cousins who the idea of having to locate a stamp was uh, <laughs> the be all end all of if they were going to mail in their ballot. Right. Uh -huh. at, hey, come to my house. I have all the stamps you need and we will discuss <laughs> this. You can ask it, right. It just makes it a little easier. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Burden. I'm so Burden. excited. Oh, I'm so sorry, no, no, Julian. I just wanted to say I'm so excited also, I just want to tag this in before we end about the Secretary of State's Promote the Vote campaign, because I do think this is super important and the Commission is really excited to participate this year. Um, really just helping people sort of find a more um, positive place, particularly on the internet, mm -hmm. talking about voting and sort of encouraging voting and encouraging folks to get involved and telling them how in a way that just after many, many years of very contentious politics mm -hmm. can feel supportive and uplifting. Mm -hmm. And so the commission is really excited to participate uh, on one through line of this campaign of yours to promote the vote women, encouraging mm -hmm. women up and down California to get involved, to vote, to represent their communities, to bring their communities along and to be part of this sort of big team sport we're calling democracy. Yep. And we are really grateful for the opportunity to participate oh. in such a cool campaign. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Oh my goodness. No, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this has been a labor of love for both me and Julian. And we just want people to feel included in this democracy mm -hmm. and feel like they have access to the information they need to make their decisions. And so to get this opportunity to partner with you, we are very grateful for. Um, so it's very sweet of you to say, this is the second <laughs> podcast I'm getting kind of choked up on. <laughs> Well, um, if you are a partner of the commission, you'll be getting an email with a toolkit from us in early September that will tell you how you also can participate in this very cool project. Uh, and all you got to do is use the hashtag and the logo we'll send you and you are going to talk to your community and your voice, how you do and join us, help us build a big sort of collaborative, connected community of women who are going to vote. Yeah. Yes. Yep. More inclusive civic culture. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, so exciting to, to see that coming to life in the next couple of weeks here. So everyone be on the lookout for that. Absolutely. But Darcy, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We hope that this conversation moves just beyond this platform and this space, and it can inspire people not only to register to vote, but to also advocate for their communities um, and help them find their voice and um, do something great with it. So thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, for absolutely. having me. Okay. <laughs> <Yay. laughs> Hey, Julian, did I tell you that I've decided to make this election season my voter era? I signed up for Where's My Ballot, checked my voter status, and shared the info with three of my friends. I'm promoting my vote. See what I did there? Me too. And it's so easy. Don't forget to sign up to track your ballot at whereismyballot.sos.ca.gov. And you can check your voter status at voterstatus.sos.ca.gov. All right, we are back. We just finished our interview with Darcy and it is amazing. Um, she made such a great case for why all of us should get out and vote. Uh, Julian, what did you think of that conversation? I feel fired up. I mean, yes. 
I feel like this happens after like every conversation that we have with a guest, but I just feel so like excited and I feel hopeful and I feel like I want to get out and like spread that to other people and have them feel encouraged and excited. Um, but so many, so many great points were brought up. I think one thing that I was maybe not nervous about, but very cognizant of was that, you know, not everyone's going to love an episode about gender equity especially a conversation happening between three women. I feel like sometimes that comes off as um, not negative, but, you know, I think maybe it doesn't always feel super welcoming to the like male population. Maybe they don't feel as though they have a, a, a place in that conversation. But one thing that Darcy really touched on was that this is for like the greater good. You know, we're not here to propel women, you know, past, men in any sort of race this is about creating equality and equity from the beginning so that everyone has the opportunity to choose candidates to speak to issues to have their voice be heard on an equal playing field so that we are choosing the best of the best you know and i think that's something that's really important to remember i think growing up as as women we tend to kind of shrink ourselves down a little bit. Um, mm. And this is not, this is not an issue of, again, making, making women out to be the best and the smartest. And like, we need, we need the spotlight because we're so much better and mm -hmm. anything like that. This is about straight up equality, just mm -hmm. level that playing field and, and it'll make things better for it everyone under the sun. And I think that's really important to to remember when we have these kinds of conversations. Absolutely. I mean, you know, equality not only benefits women, um, it benefits men as well. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, I think I'm glad you brought that up because I personally didn't even think about that. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> three women talking about gender equity. Um, <laughs> but I think that... Um, all of these conversations are case in point to how your vote connects to your community. Yeah. And we all bring different things to the table mm -hmm. and those tape that those things impact how we vote. Yeah. And I think when I go to the polls, I'm thinking about my community. I'm thinking about my, um, you know, my male friends, mm -hmm. my two best friends living in LA. I will not say their names, but um, <laughs> Give them a shout I think out. about them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think about my family and yeah. the communities they live in, the community mm -hmm. I live in. So I think um, we all have the same sort of through line. Mm -hmm. And um, I think these conversations, I hope when people are listening to them know that um, that they're for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and again, I love that she brought up the importance of voting in, you know, local elections as well, because that affects, that affects your day to day. You know, she was saying mm -hmm. that because of who she voted for, how they are allocating, you know, funds, the potholes in her neighborhood are, are being fixed. That is like a direct, that is a direct response of, of who you're voting for and mm -hmm. what you're doing with your own power and how mm -hmm. it's affecting your communities. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we go to vote, and we are thinking about our communities, we're thinking about our friends, we're thinking about our families, we're thinking about how these bills, how these candidates, how these issues affect their lives as well. Mm -hmm. It just, it just makes, it just makes everything better. And I, and I don't know if that sounds so like kind of fantasy land of the world. No, can I be mean, such it's a, true. You know, yeah. The world can be such a great place if we just like cared about other people. <laughs> And I think you gotta break it out in song. Um, no, I, I agree. <laughs> I I absolutely agree. I love the connections that she was making about um, you know simple things like potholes and mm -hmm. and clean water. And yeah. I mean, well, clean water is not a simple thing, but <laughs> um, 
I think people forget that we yeah. get caught up on um, things that really are not going to be the things that impact us on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that when we, as Secretary Weber said, when we don't vote, we're giving that power away to yeah. someone else. Mm -hmm. And we may not like what they do with that power. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea of voting being an act of community, don't give your power away to support your community, to, to bring those voices in the ballot box mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. to our voting booth with you say because none of us vote alone we're right. always bringing our pieces of our community our family our friends mm -hmm. uh, in with us so I feel like it's important to lean into that yeah um and um I think it makes voting a little less daunting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that she has these really difficult conversations with people who lack better word, like across the aisle or whatever, um, people who vote differently and think differently, but still have sense of like respect for each other. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so easy when we're on like the internet or something and you see someone who has like a completely different opinion from you. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to discount them they're mm -hmm. a stranger. They're like, they have, they're not a part of your life. So you don't have to care about what they say. Mm -hmm. But when you have these conversations with people that you respect and admire and care for, who happen to have differing political views, that really changes the game. That really mm -hmm. changes the way that you approach these issues. Because then when you're filling out your little ballot box, your, your ballot there, you're remembering, oh, so-and-so said this about this issue, and this is how this issue makes them feel. It makes things very real. It makes things very like tangible, and it's not just like a far distant thought anymore. Mm -hmm. You're seeing the direct effects to people in your immediate life, yep. and that mm -hmm. just, that changes the perspective completely. And I hope that change of perspective also gets more people involved, gets them to care a bit more, and it gets them to have these conversations to kind of yeah. open, the, open their way of thinking and to consider someone other than themselves. Absolutely. And I think a first step is to look at getting together with family mm -hmm. and friends and sitting down and having those conversations, bring your voter information guides when they are available mm -hmm. and your ballots and and sit down and have those conversations order a pizza you know get your favorite beverages <laughs> um and sit down with your your trusted community um and look at the issues that are affecting your community um and how you can affect that kind of change yeah. so um i i loved the conversation i hope uh everyone who listens to it also loves the conversation mm -hmm. um this is our last podcast episode Alleg <laughs> allegedly allegedly we don't we don't um, know we don't know what's going to happen we hope we are able to come back and have some more yeah great conversations maybe, maybe for we'll now. Be back. maybe we'll be back for That's now true. um but as we look at these three episodes that we have done what do you think is or what are you taking away from these conversations? I would say that I hope that we can share with people that voting doesn't have to be scary. You know, voting could take a lot of time and effort and it could be very overwhelming to try to weigh your options. But if you go in with the idea that you just want to use your power, use your voice and speak up for other people in your lives, in your communities. Um, I think that should be enough to kind of get you, get you out the door, get you to take that first step um, to be involved, to be engaged and to be civically active. Cause it's 
it's kind of the least that we can do, you know, as, as people on this spinning, floating rock in the universe, I think to just care about other people and to take some matters into your own hands mm -hmm. um, and to have a voice and have a, has, have a say in what goes on in the world around you. I think that's something that we really shouldn't take lightly. I agree. I, I agree. I've had so many great people in my life that have taught me the importance of advocacy and um, what to do uh, when you receive that space in the table and how at the table and how you bring others with you mm -hmm. uh, to sit with you in that um, space. And I've always tried to have that be the center of everything that I do the decisions that I make. And I think these conversations helped to sort of solidify my focus about the importance of community, the importance of inclusivity, and, and how all of the different elements of voting, whether it be um, gender issues or health issues or economy issues, even though all of those things are wrapped up together, mm -hmm. um, impact and should drive our motivation to want to be involved in our democracy. And that's ultimately what it boils down to. Um, and that it's not a daunting experience. Um, we all have friends and family who can be there to support us on the road to the, to the ballot box. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, but I just think the connection between the three conversations that we had speaks to what Promote the Vote California is about. And I am happy that we were able to have them. Absolutely. Me I am too. so cheese ball today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's nice. It is. It's a nice reminder. Yeah. We took this kind of project on as a, like we were scared because I mean, you and I are not forefront spotlight kind of people. Nope. Um, but it's, I'm so glad that we did it. And I'm, I'm very happy that we got to have these conversations and we got to put them out into the world. And I hope that people listen to them and enjoy them as well. And they can share them with their friends and family. Yes, absolutely. Um, so on that note, I think that we are going to say goodbye, mm -hmm. um, for now, for now. we might be back, <laughs> we may be back up in your ears <laughs> next week. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no, maybe not <laughs> next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but we've enjoyed our conversations. Thank you, um, to secretary Weber, uh, to Dr. Shapiro, and finally to Darcy for some amazing conversations. Um, Julian, I always enjoy hanging out with you. Ah, oh, um, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. <laughs> it's been a ride, girl. It's been a ride. It sure has. Um, so... Have a good day, everybody. And I'm going to leave you with our amazing, world famous slogan just vote, y'all. Just vote. That's all you got to do. Vote. <laughs> November 5th. Vote. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye. This is Promote the Vote California. The podcast is brought to you by the California Secretary of State's Office. It's hosted by Kaliga Edwards and me, Julian Castillo, analysts and outreach coordinators for the election division. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our summer podcast series, Promote the Vote California, the podcast. We hope we were able to provide thought-provoking conversations, inspiration to get involved in your communities, and most importantly, to encourage you to vote this November. Remember y'all, just vote. To learn more about our program, visit promotethevoteca.sos.ca.gov.